When we think about our priorities in climbing, the send is giving the highest prestige. The process of repeated failures in order to fully learn a route is to be avoided as much as possible. Climbs are flashed and then forgotten. We care more about getting to the top than how we got to the top. This video poses a question that every climber should ask themselves. Is my beta actually good? We'll look at some criteria to determine if how you climb can stand up to the rigors of consistency and sustainability. After all, once is never. The simplest way to tell if beta is good is whether or not it's repeatable. We can apply this in two ways. Pick a climb that's at your max on-site or flash level. This means the hardest grade you can send on your first try. Choose one that is physically exerting, about 7 to 10 moves, and with no built-in rests. It can be a problem you've done before. Climb it once, and then without any rest, climb it again. Were you able to repeat it using your beta even while you were tired? If so, your beta was good. If not, there are probably a few things you can tweak. For my tired repeat, I've selected a thuggy overhung V5. The crux is at the start and I've experimented with some different beta to find one that is most efficient for me. For the move going from the brain to the side pole, I've tried heel hooking the start hold and I've tried towing hard and reaching with full extension. Both took too long and used way too much energy, so I decided the quickest way was just to cut feet. Sometimes breaking the rules is the best option. Repeatable beta can also show you whether or not you're using high percentage moves. Pick a climb that's at the borderline of your red point level. This is the hardest grade you've sent in one session, but only after multiple attempts. Repeat the climb using the same beta you used when you sent it. Were you able to repeat it cleanly on your first try? If so, your original beta was probably good. If you found yourself falling a few times on the same move, then chances are your method for doing that move is low percentage. That means it's only something you can execute some of the time. For this example, I've picked a powerful sustained V7. It's hard all the way from the start to the finish. I got a bit lucky on my first send as my original beta was a bit too desperate and low percentage. It felt like I could fall off on several moves. To clean up my beta, I converted some of those low percentage moves to high percentage. First, I set my left foot ahead of time before reaching out with my right hand. This widens my base of support and prevents me from cutting feet. Here, I add a drop knee to create another point of contact for my base of support before reaching out with my right hand. Originally, I used only my right foot to make the reach. Even though this utilized the first rule of opposite hand and foot, I still had to rely a lot on accuracy or else I'd miss the move. With the drop knee, it's much more high percentage. The last move I changed is adding in a left heel hook to hold position while the left hand moves to the side pole. With my original beta, I did this move without the heel hook, making the left hand move feel like a desperate release and catch. Bruce Lee once said, water can flow or it can crash. This is certainly the case with climbing as well. Flow is a distinct characteristic you can spot very quickly. Strong climbers are pretty impressive, but everyone wants to climb like the climber who makes it look effortless. If you want to know if your beta is good, check to see if the moves flow. There are two ways to spot flow in climbing. One, look at the transitions. Each move should be done in a way that naturally progresses into the next. This means that the body is placed in the ideal position and energy is not wasted by stopping momentum unnecessarily. Two, count the number of moves. A beta that flows uses the least amount of moves possible without sacrificing the execution of the climb. The best way to do this is to avoid any unnecessary matching of the hands or swapping of the feet. The opposite of flow is something I call stop and go climbing. Each move is completely isolated from the next. 
there is a distinct pause as the body moves, stops, resets, and moves again. A big waste of energy. Aesthetics may not be the top priority for most climbers, but having your climbing look good is certainly the mark of a good climber. Setters leave us clues with where they place holds and how each hold is angled. Therefore, we can generally decipher the intended beta by analyzing the hold path. Here are two questions you can ask yourself when solving the beta. One, am I utilizing each hold in the best way? This means leveraging the angle of the hold and using it in conjunction with the proper counterpressure of the foothold. 2. Am I sequencing this in a way that makes sense? To demonstrate, here's a vertical V5 with a bit of a confusing start. The first move is obviously for the right hand, but after that, should I keep bumping out the right hand and shuffle my hands over? Looking closer at the orientation and angles of the handholds, the beta starts to reveal itself. The middle slot is an undercling and unusable as a downward pulling hold. The furthest slot looks good for either hand, but the fact that it's so far out suggests that a left hand cross would work better than bumping out the right hand. There's also an outer hold for the right hand to stabilize after the cross move is complete. The undercling comes back into play once I've completed the first sequence and I'm setting up for the big right hand dead point. It's perfectly angled so that I can have something to pull throughout the range of me standing up to make the reach. The top section has a traverse that mimics the bottom, so I do another cross move to finish out the sequence. I hope you found this video helpful. More importantly, I hope you feel inspired to refine your movement and perhaps revisit some of your old sense. Until next time, move better, climb harder.